Okay, good evening. It is Sunday the 6th of March. I hope you're doing well and our usual wrap up of the major headlines to be aware of from this weekend, particularly on the Ukraine situation, but also an outlook for the week. We do have things like the ECB meeting and also US CPI on Thursday is expected to come in at 7.9%. So what does that mean for the Fed going forward and the market in itself? We'll talk about that in a moment. But let's kick things off with looking at the map of the latest where Ukraine has called off an attempt this weekend to evacuate civilians from the city of Maripol, which is based down here in the southeastern corner. Very contentious area, of course, because this is in the Russian separatist area of Donetsk and Luhansk, and also just north of where forces over the Crimea have taken control over that southern um, port side of the country. Uh, military experts still expect Russia's main objective will remain to be the encirclement of Kiev, the capital. Here's some of the direction of Russian advances at this point in time. Uh, the capital appears, in terms of Russian uh, progress, has been very little overall uh, because of tactical and believed to be logistical failures. However, this will be a key thing we'll be looking out for later on this week as they will look to still continue to take on the capital city in order to neutralize the country in itself from a Russian perspective. Uh, on that point, Vladimir Putin has met with his Turkish counterpart, as you can see here, uh, Erdogan, and said that Kiev must agree to his demands if fighting is to end. And just to refresh your memory, what are Putin's demands? Well, he wants demilitarization of Ukraine and recognition of Crimea. And to give you an idea, again, of going back to the drawing board of what, what is the rationale and why is actually Russia doing this? Well, here's a look at um, NATO and how NATO has expanded eastwards, which really kind of cuts to the heart of the, the rationale of why Russia has taken this action. So here's Russia, of course, on the right hand side, Ukraine here in the yellow. Uh, and as you can see, um, the UK or England with, with France, uh, Italy and the rest have been part of NATO for a long time. But what's happened is over time, going through 1999, 2004 through to 2020 specifically, as NATO has gained further geographic coverage further into Eastern Europe. So starting up here where you've got the likes of Lithuania, Latvia, then you come down to Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, and then Romania down here. And if you look at this then from a, a geography point of view, you can see the rationale why Ukraine is such an important territory for Russia to hold off the NATO advance further east. Because if you actually look here, this, this country here, obviously north of Ukraine is Belarus, uh, and Belarus forms part of what's known as the CSTO, which is the Collective Security Treaty Organization. So it's kind of the Russian counter to that of NATO, which is mainly Western Europe. Uh, this would include countries like Russia themselves, Belarus, but also Georgia down here in the south. And looking at this from a, a defensive military position, you can see Georgia here to cut off some of the, the southern side of the entry from geography coming up through the Black and Caspian Sea, the annexation of Crimea, of course, in 2014 to take control of the Black Sea as a defensive position. And then you can see the importance of they have uh, overall kind of control of Belarus uh, in this treaty. But then Ukraine, you can see why it's so important, because otherwise it would open up an expansive territory for then the potential not the likelihood of this would ever happen for the NATO and Western forces to be able to move into Russia. Uh, and obviously Russia very vulnerable um, with that because of the planes and the way of the setup of the geography of Russia. It would mean that the land here is so expansive, it would be indefensible from a Russian point of view. And hence the reason they have to take control and hold on to Ukraine as a last kind of red line. So hopefully that kind of updates you and reminds you of, of why we're at this particular juncture and why Russia is very unlikely to let this go at this point of time because strategically um, the geography is that Ukraine holds the key here because with them already with Belarus in control, um, this gives them a, a fortified kind of a geography line of defense at this point of time. Um, the other things then to be aware of, uh, a few other headlines, is what's been going on financially with Russia, obviously under great pains at the moment with the latest um, sanctions and Russia and Russian companies will be allowed to pay foreign creditors in rubles. It's come to light over the weekend, according to a decree signed by Vladimir Putin on Saturday as a way to starve off defaults while the capital controls continue to remain in place. Um, the other things that we've heard as well this weekend is that Russia's VTB bank is preparing to wind down its European operations after being hit hard by sanctions, according to the FT, as you can see here, citing people familiar with internal discussions. Um, 
Equally so, Spurbank, Russia's biggest lender, has decided to exit the European market last week. And together, Spurbank and VTP account for more than half half of Russia's banking market. So really severe uh, impact that this is having, of course, at this point in time. We're unable to see Russian-related stocks. They haven't traded as yet since all of this has begun, and the Russian stock market will be closed uh, for trading to at least Wednesday, but it wouldn't be too much of a shock to see that rolled over a little bit more uh, again. And then from a corporate perspective, although there's been um, lots of companies now coming to light, the latest being that Visa and MasterCard announced over the weekend that it um, will suspend their operations to Russia. So that's kind of your latest roundup of what's been going on there. The other things that are kind of uh, indirectly related to this um, with the energy market, of course, being a, a key component that the markets are looking at here because of the knock-on implications for inflation and subsequent then uh, reaction function from central banks. Uh, the US is said to be in talks with European countries on a joint approach to any ban on Russian oil imports that could still ensure adequate supplies, as according to the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken over the weekend. So keeping an eye on that um, for sure. And then elsewhere, there's Libya and Iran updates as well, to be aware from a, an energy perspective. So for Libya, uh, oil production has fallen to 920,000 uh, barrels a day as the Shahara, their biggest field in El Fiel, have both been shut down. To give you a bit of context, the drop down to 920 uh, comes as um, crude was pumping at about 1.2 million as of the middle of last week in Libya. Um, the parliament, and why all of this is happening, is parliament swore in a new government last week to replace um, the existing PM and his administration, but he's resisting an attempt to remove him from power, and that's heightened risk of a renewed civil war in Libya, which is very commonplace in that country, of course, seeing big volatile swings in their amount of production. But of course, then, um, that means that there's less production albeit we're talking just under 300,000 worth. But of course, this comes in the context of at the moment, um, WTI crude closing at a 115 handle, uh, the closing futures trade uh, last week um, at a 2008 high. The other thing then that people are looking out for in the energy market is Iran. So this is another factor that could well support the bull case for, for crude oil price, prices at the moment. This is because traders are watching out for any further delays in the Iranian nuclear talks following Russia's demands that they want U.S. guarantees that the sanctions it faces over the Ukraine conflict will not hurt its trade with Tehran. Uh, and we know, of course, that there's a close relationship between those two countries. Um, if, even if the deal does come through, I was reading a few things over this weekend, um, and it was saying that um, if a deal was struck, um, and Iran does go back to that 2015 nuclear accord deal in whatever shape or form, it would take several months to restore oil flows, even if it reaches a deal. And obviously, the, the pain at the moment of the supply risk is very immediate. Uh, and so even if it was to strike a deal, which I still think I've always been quite bearish on the prospects of that happening, and particularly given Iran's close ties to that of Russia, I don't tend to see that happening this week. And it could be another bullish factor as well to support prices going further forward. Uh, Iran, Iran's top authority, Supreme Leader uh, Khamenei, Khamenei, of course, has publicly and privately been calling for closer ties with Russia uh, due to the deep mistrust that they have uh, as a collective uh, over the United States. So hard to see that deal going through uh, anytime soon. So any of that risk of kind of thoughts of supply coming to market to fill the void of um, looking to counteract the rising price, I think is probably unlikely to happen um, at this point. And then you've got China. Um, you probably would have read over the weekend, uh, they've unveiled a growth target of about 5.5%. 5 5.5%, um, 5 you know, many countries would kill for that type of growth uh, level at this point in time. But that is, as far as the target is concerned from China, the lowest in three decades. Uh, it does follow a year-on-year -year growth of just 4% in the fourth quarter of 2021. But at 5.5% in context, it is actually above what some other um, estimates have been. Um, so it's a little bit more bullish on their side than, say, the IMF, which I think was down at a 5% range. So it's not as bad, bad as the kind of headlines are coining it at this point. Beyond that, uh, there's something bigger here for China, and really that is the idea of them shoring up its political significance to the Communist Party. And President Xi is expected to make that unprecedented bid 
to stay as the leader for a third term at a key party meeting, of course, later this year. And a couple of things that have been happening, this Russian, um, the aggressiveness of this Russian move, um, obviously ties between those two countries were getting increasingly stronger. Uh, it was only um, prior to the, um, the Olympic Games that we had, the Winter Olympics in China, where the two were talking about unlimited potential for their relationship, but then Russia going ahead with what they've done, seemingly not informing uh, completely the Chinese of their actions up front, has seen China pivot more towards the West. So Xi's got to deal with that. Xi's also dealing with the housing market, seeing mounting defaults. He's also dealing with the country cracking down on the biggest technology companies that scared off a lot of foreign investment. So there's a number of things going on here, and Xi needs to silence the critics. He needs to also keep growth um, kind of just at pace in order to then really uh, cement then his legacy as we get in towards the back end of the year and we have this uh, his, him standing for his unprecedented bid to continue on in power. So the, the end result here is most analysts are expecting China now to be looking to do further rate cuts, increase fiscal spending, everything and anything to do to just get the economy firing again. And we, of course, heard last week about the Wall Street Journal breaking that news that although it's going to be about a year's time when they'll look to loosen coronavirus restrictions, given they've had a zero tolerance policy, there's certain cities that they'll be experimenting with. And that could also help unlock some of that future growth uh, potential. And it's important that he front loads that growth in order to then really hit the mark when they have that top level uh, Communist Party meeting later on this year. Um, other things that I thought just just quickly that was quite interesting. One was a, an equity story. So keeping an eye on Deliveroo when they open um, later on, on on Monday, a US food delivery company DoorDash is said to have considered a takeover bid for London-based Deliveroo, but the two sides have failed to reach an agreement. Uh, of course, Deliveroo has had a shocking performance um, since their, their IPO which would have been, what, a year ago or so. So, yeah, be interested to see how, how their shares react when they get underway. But as far as this week is concerned, uh, I'm not going to go everything over everything in a line-by-line -line statement. All I'm going to say is really Thursday is the key day of which uh, I'm most excited about from a, a schedule point of view, and that's because you've got two major releases, one being the ECB, their latest interest rate announcement. They're expected to postpone any major policy decisions when they meet, and uh, preferring to maintain as much flexibility as possible while assessing the economic fallout from the war in Ukraine. They do also put out their latest forecasts on things like uh, inflation and growth and so forth. But contrary to the December meeting, the ECB will want to avoid hinting at the end dates for quantitative easing or start dates for rate hikes because you know, the pattern prior to the Russian-Ukraine situation happening was that March was kind of penciled in when there was a lot of policy maneuvers to happen. The Fed to trigger the rate rise cycle, the ECB to end the active uh, kind of QE and so forth. And uh, in terms of details, probably that's going to be a much more light touch now as they try to um, hold things off to see more clarity over how the Ukraine situation plays out and energy prices and so forth. The other thing, of course, on Thursday is US CPI comes out as expected at 7.9% year on year, up from the 7.5%. So we're talking about the, the highest year on year um, rates of inflation in the US since the early 1980s. Uh, the rising cost of heating oil and gasoline has been exacerbated, of course, because of the conflict in Ukraine. And analysts at Barclays say that's likely to have driven energy prices up by around 4.7% themselves alone, just on the energy side of things. Um, regardless of inflation in the US likely to go up to near 8%, is it going to really change the game for what markets are expecting from the Fed? I don't think so. Um, so as far as the March meeting is concerned, which will be next week on the 16th, uh, I think that the 50 is probably off the table as per what uh, Powell's comments were at his semi-annual testimony last week hinting towards a preference for 25. So I think that's locked in. Uh, and then the subsequent rate hikes will, of course, be looking out on those dot plots and, and further communication when that meeting comes around. And then uh, the other thing that's happening on a Friday, which could be quite interesting, you can see I'm, I'm looking at a calendar here from ING, and their analysts have said that they're closely monitoring the University of Michigan sentiment figure, which comes out on the Friday. Uh, and mainly that's to see if the Russian invasion and its potential um, economic hit to household spending power 
via the sharp increase in gasoline prices is having any type of impact yet further on the sentiment of the US consumer. Uh, the worst thing that you're going to want to have is spiking inflation, demoralizing consumers at a point where you're having to hike rates. Hence the reason why this kind of risk of recession in the future, uh, given the rate hikes to, to come, uh, could well be a further talking point that will in intensify over, over the period ahead. All right, that is it. So quite a lot to di digest there, I know. Um, if you want to refresh on any of the notes that I've covered there, you can just jump on my, my Twitter account. My handle's there. And yeah, anything that substantial that happens on the Russian situation, I'll be sure to put out a fresh video throughout the rest of the week. But thanks for watching and have a good week ahead.